Welcome back, Warriors. Kwe Tanse Sego Anibuju. Kwe Nin Deluizi Pam Palmeter, and I am the host of this show, The Warrior Life. This podcast is a show about living the warrior life, a lifestyle that focuses on decolonizing our minds, bodies, and spirits, while at the same time revitalizing our cultures, traditions, laws, and governing practices. It's also about asserting and living our sovereignty all over Turtle Island. And one of the ways that we do this as Indigenous peoples is to occupy places and spaces that have been denied to us, making sure that our people are represented in such a way that our children children can see themselves reflected everywhere and anywhere. Today's guest is someone that has inspired me since the first day I heard his name. The Honorable Graydon Nicholas is from Tobik First Nation and he was the first Native person to earn a law degree in New Brunswick. Then he was the first Native person to be appointed to the Provincial Court in New Brunswick and then the first native person to be appointed as Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick. I mean, he has also spent so many years working with First Nations and grassroots people on the ground on all of the issues that are important to us. And along the way, of course, has won an, a, a large number of awards, including the Order of New Brunswick, the Order of Canada, the New Brunswick Human Rights Awards, and many honorary degrees. Today, the Honorable Graydon Nicholas serves as the Chancellor of St. Thomas University, the same university where I got my Native Studies degree. Welcome to the show, Your Honor, the Honorable Graydon. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Pam. It's a pleasure for me to be here on this program with you and uh, commend you for uh, having this kind of medium for our people. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm really excited to have you here so that everybody else gets to hear all of your knowledge and wisdom and experiences that I've been able to hear throughout my life. So maybe before we get started, you could introduce yourself in the way that you like to. Uh, well, uh, my name is Graydon Nicholas. I am uh, was born in a pretty large family uh, on my community. We call it Negotkog in our language, which is Wolistogui. And uh, so we're brought up on reserve. My mom and dad had uh, 12 kids. And uh, two children died as infants. And then the rest of us as survivors, we were uh, seven guys, seven men and uh, three sisters. And uh, so we lived on reserve. I was brought up in my language. It was a Catholic family. And uh, I didn't learn a word of English, I don't think, until I started school in grade one. And I was only, uh, what, five years old at the time. And uh, I still remember very, 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 uh, I guess, in a way of nostalgia of how I started school, uh, it, it kind of went like this. Uh, the night before, my older brothers and sisters would gone to school. That uh, here's what they would say in my language: Now, so what did I just say in my language? Uh, I. The night before, my brothers and sisters said, tomorrow morning, you're going to go to school for the first time. And then the teacher there is going to ask you, uh, what is your name? And when she asks you your name, you tell her that your name is Graydon. And that's the first time I ever knew my name was Graydon because in the large family of indigenous communities, you're either somebody's brother or sister or, you know, your, your cousin to so-and-so. And we all had nicknames. So. Uh, sure enough, next morning, you know, I got up real excited going to school and the teacher who was a nun asked my name. I answered, Graydon. And then she said, uh, what's your last name? I had no clue what the last name was. I mean, I'd reserve your someone, but you didn't, if you're a son of somebody or and I had no idea what the last name was. So I couldn't answer it. I just went like this, just shrugged because I'd never heard of it. And uh, so anyway, so he went on and. And my friend sitting next to me was a guy, my cousin, and she asked him, what is your name? The response was Chucky. And Chucky was a nickname we had for him. He says, no, your name can't be Chucky. I don't have anybody on this list called Chucky. I mean, Chucky is sort of some, for some non-natives, is a short name for Charles, right? But he, he said, well, no, he says, he said, no, on the list, your, your name must be Martin. Martin. Yeah, I, I do kind of, and I, and I kind of back to him and says, well, uh, in my language, I say, come with the dam on with the Gaki Gary, you better give a good response to this teacher. And so, anyway, so teacher says, uh, Martin, what's your last name? 
And he looked at me and I just, I didn't know what he was either. It's just uh, Martin, Martin, Martin. And he was came a bit of a crusty background, you know. So <laughs> you know, uh, Martin the hell with it. So, <laughs> so needless to say, Martin and I stayed in school first day. And for <laughs> for whatever way we behaved. So uh, when I arrived home um, late, uh, you know, like uh, school was done by 3.30 and it wasn't that far from where we lived. So my mother says, oh, how come it took you so long to get to get home? And I told her as well, uh, the teacher asked me to stay there. And she says, uh, for what is it? I don't know. She, that was my cousin, Chucky and I were asked to go stay in school. We're the only ones. So anyway, she goes down and sees the nun and says, what's going on? How come you... This happened. She says, well, he didn't know his last name. My mother says, how do you expect a five-year-old not to know his last name when we don't even mention it in our family? What's the matter with you? My, like my mother was a rib and advocate to have on your side. So, so anyway, uh, she says, he doesn't even know his last name. He he just remembered his first name from last night. So, so that's how I started school in grade one back in, back in 1951, you know? And... Uh, so as a result, at the end of grade one, because uh, uh, I, I didn't know how to read, I actually failed. I failed grade one, you know, and when I got back and, and uh, my mother says, do you have a report card? I said, oh yeah, they gave me this. So she looks at it and I saw it, but I really couldn't read what was it all about. So she says, oh no. I said, oh, what happened? You know, in our language, I say, Dunleo, what happened? You know, so she says, you didn't pass. I said, I didn't pass what? He says, well, you got to go back to grade one again in the fall. I said, oh, is that right? How come? And she would say, in other words, you don't know how to read. And that's true. I did not know how to read. And I could see words, but I just couldn't read them in a sentence. So <laughs> and when I went back a second time in the fall of 52, <laughs> my uh, and school was grade one and grade two and kind of grade three together, right? And so Chucky, my friend, was had made it through. He was actually in grade two, and I was in grade <laughs> one, but he was set together. And he said, uh, in my language, Neil Stagakimel, well, I'll teach you so that you'll know how to read. Oh, I, mm-hmm. so I said, well, he went then, you know, that was good. So actually, he was my first tutor. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> eventually, anyway, that's the early story of, of how uh, my educational experience began <laughs> in, uh, in September 19, uh, 1951. So. It's hard to believe, you know, it's not even that long ago, but to have that experience and, you know, that just reminds me about your community because being from New Brunswick, you know, our communities are so small. Let's look at how powerful, there's so many powerful people in your community who are today advocates of protecting uh, yes, your yes. language or advocates of human rights at the international level. Like, I mean, you just come from a really powerful community. Well, that, that must be that must be our creator's design. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even if you do fail grade one because you don't know your last name. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So oh anyway. my goodness. Well, you know, one of the things I love about this podcast is I get to talk to some of my heroes, like people that I have considered mentors and looked up to my whole life. And you know, you you are one of those people um, for lots of different reasons. When I was younger to learn the fact that, you know, I hadn't met you yet, but there was actually a native person who earned a law degree and that was possible, you know, like that was something that that kind of planted the first seed in my mind that that was even possible before then, you know, there was only certain areas that we worked in. It wasn't in those other areas and it kind of planted the seed that, you know, maybe I could be a lawyer someday. And then, you know, as the world would have it, here I am at St. Thomas university taking native law in my native studies program. And I get to learn from you. And by that time, you know, you had already long been a lawyer and I think you had already been a, um, appointed as a provincial court judge by that by that time. And, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about some of the challenges you might have faced being the first Native person to graduate from law school. I mean, you wouldn't have had the usual kind of supports that Native people do today. Uh, that's true. And uh, just before I answer that part, uh, you know, Pam, I gotta, like, I, I went to um, St. Francis Xavier University in Nova Scotia. And it was my older brother who actually talked me to go in there because my in high school I was in the Air Cadets, and I was thinking of uh, Royal Military College actually uh, to go there because I was interested in science and engineering, and very good in math and science. 
So that's what I actually wanted to do. And uh, I had to go through the usual tests to do that. And before I did the final one in Halifax, uh, my older brother asked me, he says, have you thought of where you want to go to school? I said, yeah, I'm thinking of Royal Military College. Here. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, military is a career. And he says, uh, why? So I told him, I love sports, I love science and all this stuff. He says, geez, there's a real good school in Nova Scotia. You know? <laughs> I said, oh, what's it called? <laughs> he says, Francis Xavier University. So I said, oh, is that right? Uh, he said, because he had gone there two years. And, and so, it, and I said, well, I don't know, maybe I should apply. And he said, yeah, you should apply there. So I didn't, that's, I got into back. And uh, so in my last year of university in, in you know, 67, 68, uh, there was a, they, back then they called it teaching on Indian issues. They had on campus about sort of like March, I'm talking about, March of that year. And so I went because my friend Gordy McDonald was making out from, uh, I think it was from Ember too, if I recall Gordy. And he, we were both in science together. I said, Gordy, why don't we go listen to this? See what, maybe we'll learn something, you know, because they're both science students. And so sure enough, we went there and that's the very first time both of us ever heard of Treaty of Rights, Indian Act, and all of these other relationships that uh, that the, on the community you would you would have. I mean, neither of us were ever interested in law, and uh, so we went to listen to it. And it just so happened that uh, there was a newspaper article in the Cape Breton Post, and Gordy and I always went to have coffee. You know, <laughs> back then we had maybe I don't know ten dollars a month for spending money, so we. What we would do is we'd pull our money, at least have a cup of coffee and a donut or something, you know, so we could do this every day. And uh, so we went for, and he says, gee, look at this article from the Cape Breton Post. You know, there's this guy from the community there who uh, is going to be sent to prison for four years. I said, for what? What did he do? He said, well, he, 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 uh, he burned his own house. I said, what? He burned his own house? And you can go to jail for that? I mean, we didn't know. We were very naive. And he says, yeah, here it is right in the article. So I read that article and it's identified him as a Mi'kmaq guy. And the circumstances were that he had an old house where his family lived and a new house that was being constructed for his family to replace that one. So anyway, the, the bureaucr- bureaucracy, I guess, wouldn't allow them to move in. So he figured if I burn my house, they got to move into the new house. And that's what he did. So it seems to me pretty logical here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you had to provide for your family. Well, then I told Gordy, I said, well, gee, Gordy, my mother gave me a copy of the Federal Indian Act when I went to university here. I've never opened it, but I've got it. And she told me when I left in the fall of 64, I'm going to give you this little yellow copy of the Indian Act, which was back then. And he said, I want you to read that and come and help our people in the future. Well, I always say like a good son. Yes, mom, thank you. I never looked at it until this particular situation. <laughs> so that night I studied that, read that thing cover to cover, and I couldn't believe what I was reading. I said, well, gee, there's a provision here, Gordy, right under the Indian Act, which says if an Indian destroys his own per- personal property, he's subject to a fine, I don't know, maybe $100 and maybe a week in jail. I said, how could that? How could those people be so stupid? Have they ever heard of the Indian Act? <laughs> you know, are you just students? You have all these. I said, my goodness, didn't the judge know anything? Didn't the police? Did, anyway, all these questions were in my mind. And uh, I, I, that was only my introduction to a thing called law. And I kind of forgot about it. And when I graduated in 68, uh, I went back to my community for work. And then uh, my brother, who was a chief at the time, said, they're looking for some teachers downtown. I said, oh, is that right? So I went to go see my old principal. And I said, I understand you're looking for teachers. Uh, he said, yeah, we're looking for teachers in science and math. I said, well, Jesus, that's right up my alley. That's my major. Uh, where's the school? He said, well, there are, there are two schools, one up in Plaster Rock and one in Perth Thunder, which is Southern Victoria, which is where the kids from our reserve went. I said, oh, gee, yeah. I, all this. I went to the principal of both schools. And then I said, okay, I'll teach in Perth Andover, Southern Victoria. And he said, well, okay, sure, we'll take you, but you have to have a temporary teacher's license. I said, oh, where do you get that? He said, you have to go to summer school at UNB and uh, you'll take two full courses and uh, you do that three years and then you've got six credits and then you, you'll get your degree after that. I said, okay, good enough. So in July of 2000 and uh, 2000, I mean, 1968, uh, I went to summer school took my courses on teaching, all this stuff that you have, the regulatory things, the law and everything. 
I was well, or first time I ever so well organized. <laughs> so, so, and then just when we finished our courses, like on a Friday and exams would start on uh, Monday morning, I got a message, oh, come on up to uh, be the superintendent of schools in that area and the school principal and we'll finalize uh, your contract. I was all excited, you know, and, <laughs> and back then the teacher's contract was $3,600 a year. And we did a lot of money back then. It was a lot of money back in, back in 1968. I always say, look, the price of a Mustang was seven was eighteen hundred. So that's a, you get two Mustangs for that salary. So I said, I'm going to get myself a car for sure. But uh, so then I went to the principal. I mean, their office next morning on a Saturday morning, and I said, uh, okay. He said, okay, how are you doing? I said, great. I said, well organized. My my course load is my courses. I have to teach. They're all I got them all organized. And I'm ready to go. And uh, see, because school starts in that area mid about the third week of August because of the potato break that they would have and so I said oh and school would start at that time and I said yeah and I said so I'm looking forward to it. I just have to write my exams now but I think um, I'll do all right and so they looked at each other and I said well we have a bit of a problem I said oh what's the problem he says well we're not sure whether you should teach during in Victoria up in Plaster I said Plaster off I said <laughs> that's 25 miles away I said you know I don't know teach right here where where I, I could stay under reserve and the kids from the reserve get bus there. So they said, well, this is where I think we might have a problem. I said, well, what's the problem? He says, well, disciplining the kids and all that. I said, well, they're teaching us in school law. We can't touch the kids anyway. So it's up to the school principal. If there's a disciplinary problem. He said, go down, see the principal and, and whatever is done there is done. So he said, well, we have a few other concerns. I said, oh, what are they? He says, well, we're not sure. You're living in the community. You're teaching there. I said, I'm, I'm sorry. You're telling me that because I live in Tubic and the kids go to school on Tubic that I should not teach at Southern Victoria? Well, not quite like that. Something like that. The sort of thing. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I have a friend, Billy Jevorostic, which is roster and Tubic First Nation, you know, and uh He's at, he's at summer school and he's going to teach also some science courses here and their students go to Southern Victor. Did you tell him that he couldn't teach there as well uh, because, this, because he lives in the village and also because he, uh, the kids are there? No response other than red faces. I said, well, okay, I see what you're trying to tell me. And he, he said, no, it's not what you think. I said, it doesn't matter what I think. I'm not going to teach for you and last for rock for sure and I'm not going to teach for you in Southern Victoria either and so I got up to leave and so the, the principal well now just a minute now he says you, you shouldn't you shouldn't be that upset I said well upset I said why am I upset because I, I don't want to teach for you I said no I'll go do something else he says well what are you going to do I said well listen don't worry about grade nickel grade nickel is a survivor right from grade one <laughs> I said, so I'll, I'll find something else to do. What the heck, you know? And, uh, and uh, so I got up to leave. Oh, I was really upset. My goodness, I was upset. But anyway, yeah. So then I left. And that weekend, my roommate and I got together. And he said, great. And, uh, how did it go? Where's the contract? I said, no contract. Because I had told the principal, I said, you have to find a teacher within three weeks. Because school starts then. And so uh, my roommate said, great. And, uh, we talked so much and commiserated so much, I guess we missed the uh, uh, supper hour at the UNB uh, diner. Uh, and, and so he said, let's go up to St. Thomas. I had never really been to St. Thomas, uh, it's same, same area. He said, they have a better cafeteria there, let's go up there. So we did. And when we walked past the library, Harry Irving Library and up towards St. Thomas, I saw this building. I said, holy cow, what's that building? That's the law school. I said, That's the law school. I said, Wow, I wonder how you get in there. So, anyway, we went ahead our supper next morning, wrote my exam. And then, after uh, in the afternoon, I went over to the building, brand new building, great big building. And I asked this guy, I said, Look, this is the law school. Yeah, it is. I said, Well, how do you get in here? He said, well, you have to, you know, how do you, <laughs> you have to apply and all this stuff. I said, Okay, all right. And you have to have a degree. I said, Well, I got a degree. Well, we just don't accept anybody. I said, Well, why not? <laughs> <laughs> he says, well, you know, your marks have to be good and all that stuff. And I said, well, yeah, I've majored in mathematics and science, so that should be good enough. <laughs> but anyway, he says, I'm not in charge of admission anyway. So uh, he gave me the number of the guy in charge of admission. 
I called him that night and I said, look, I understand you're responsible for admission of law school. He said, yes, I am. And who are you? So I told him who I was and where I was from. He said, gee, we've never had an Indian go to law school here before. I said, well, I'm not applying because I'm an Indian. I'm looking <laughs> for something to do. I was supposed to be a teacher. It doesn't work out. So I'm looking at alternatives now. <laughs> so he said, well, he said, um, New law school, uh, we're going to, there are over 300 people who've applied ahead of you for first year, and we want to accept at least 100. Uh, so, in the summer of 1968, Tam, this is, you know, when you stop and think how Peter looks after you, there was a terrible mail strike in Canada. Nothing moved. This was the day before the modern means of communication we have now. He said, as far as we're concerned, all those applicants, 300 ahead of you, haven't told us they want to go here. We haven't been able to tell them they're accepted here. So as far as I'm concerned, get your application in here and you stand as good a chance as any of them. So I had to send for my marks by bus, eh? From, from wow. <laughs> I filled the form out and in a week I was accepted. That's, that's, I mean, what are the odds of that? Somebody going to law school. <laughs> <laughs> as law school opening in two weeks after that. So that's how I entered law school. There was no burning ambition, believe me, on my part to be a lawyer. And uh, so when I started law school, I got completely new discipline. I had no idea who made law, who judges were and all this stuff because I had no interest. I hadn't, mm. it didn't matter to me who, who was what. So as long as you stayed, uh, behaved yourself, you didn't have to go see a judge. Or see a <laughs> <laughs> and so, but it was a, great learning experience for me because the methodology of thought for math and science is similar to law. Uh, and uh, so it, I loved it. I liked it. So that was quite a thing for me. Mind you, it was a very uh, steep curve I had to learn because I knew nothing about say, political science. I really knew very little about history and uh, nor the government, how the governmental systems function. So I had no idea, but I learned. And so that's how I got to law school. And uh, uh, it was quite an experience. Um, uh, I, I, I think for me, the, uh, uh, after my first year law, oh, I gotta tell you this thing. This sometimes I go all over the place, but uh, what happened is in the spring, around toward the middle of March, when, the end of March, when you're getting ready for your exams at law school, I opened up the morning paper, Telegraph Journal. Look at this article. Imposter hired at Southern Victoria High School. That was the headline. And they had hired an imposter when I was <laughs> accepted his credentials. And he was a fraud, of course. You know, he was using somebody else's identity. And I'm laughing as I'm reading this article. And my friend says, what's going on? What's so funny in the newspaper? Look at the cartoon page. I said, no. I said, look at this story. He said, what is it? I said, look, if there was such a thing as poetic justice, here it is. You know, so. <laughs> and uh, anyway, after my first year law, I, uh, I had the opportunity to participate in a research project. Eventually, the book that came out was called Natives and Law, the first publication of its kind in Canada at the time. Uh, trying to use the American model of federal Indian law in, in a smaller form. And so uh, because I was from New Brunswick, I was assigned, and probably because I was Catholic, they assigned me three <clears throat> major areas of responsibility. One was the initial contact between the Spaniards and the, and the Americas, primarily in Central America and Mexico. Secondly was to deal with land claims and also dealing with treaty rights. So those are the three areas that I was work, assigned to work on. So, wow, what, did my mind ever expand? I said, oh, first of all, I never realized about this uh, relationship with conquistadors in Spain and all that, and the role that the Catholic Church would have played back then. And uh, I had no concept of what a treaty was. And uh, I had heard, I'd never really heard that much about land claims. So, but anyway, it was an immersion for me and, and what I, uh, what I learned from that summer continues to mark me right to the day in not only what I teach, but what I still continue to read. So that's the background of law, you know. Uh, outside of that, the, the second best thing that happened at law school was I got married after my first year. So, <laughs> so that, was, that was good. So it settled me down as a student, I can tell you that. You know, uh, less time playing hockey, less time with forcing around with the guys. And uh, so, no, I did, yeah. I had to, I had to uh, 
uh, mature overnight. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well you, well, you would, and and just to be learning all of this stuff for the first time, like you know, sometimes non-native people think that we just inherently are born with all this knowledge that we can just rattle off, you know, word and form of all the treaties. And I know every indigenous, you know, but it's just, it's not, you have to learn it somewhere. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, for you to be learning that, that, that's amazing. So, I mean, you graduate from law school and then you become a lawyer. I mean, what was that like? Did you just walk by a law firm one day and say, hey, I wonder if I can work there? <laughs> well, what happened What happened in New Brunswick at that time when I graduated in 71? Actually, once you graduate and passed your exams, that was sort of like the requirement for bar admission. Mm -hmm. All you had to do was article for six months. So the, uh, the original person I was actually going to article with up in my area, Perth Andover, he got appointed as a judge. So then I approached this other judge uh, who used to have people representing, uh, representing on our reserve. His name was Ted Duffy. He was in Grand Falls. So I went to see him and I said, look, Mr. Duffy, you know, like I'm looking for articles. Is it possible for me to article with you? And he said, uh, yeah, sure. It'd be great to see you. You're from the reserve. Yeah. I said, geez, you must be the first one to finish law school. I said, well, yes, I am. But I never, you know, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't, uh, I never thought of it that way at all. So. But when you're in a small town and you're not too bad in sports, then you get involved in the sports of the community. Like, uh, you know, I played senior ball and then I played uh, hockey as well, as small as I am, you know. But <laughs> it's a good thing in that Republican League, it was morally based on speed, not on muscle, because oh, they were peeling me off the boards for sure. But uh, so you kind of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a different atmosphere in, in athletics. And we would travel throughout the province playing baseball. Hockey was sort of like in that area of Madawaska, Victoria County. Uh, very, very good, very good, very competitive. And the, team, the teams are followed by their fans. And uh, so anyway, so in November, uh, I got admitted in to, uh, to the Law Society. You know, the ceremonies you have in the New Brunswick Court of Appeal and all that. So, so I went there and the headline in the paper next morning was, uh, First Indian admitted to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> when I, when, so this guy who used to manage our baseball team in Grand Falls, he'd always wonder, well, how come Graydon doesn't drink, you know, like some of the other, I said, well, I said, I just don't drink, that's all. So when he saw that headline, first he admitted to the bar, he says, oh, no, you can go into a tavern. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, 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 I said, I, I just don't drink. I said, I said, it didn't matter whether I was admitted to the bar or not, I said, but... <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it was kind of humorous in that kind of way, you know, and uh, so I continued to work representing a lot of our people in our community and, uh, and some very difficult cases. Um, I had also uh, run for a position of counselor in our community and I got elected as a band counselor wow. uh, in, 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 in the government, you know, like, and that is another story I won't share with that one. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, and you know, when you're when you're articling, you don't make much money. And when you're starting career in law, you, you don't, you make a little bit more, but you know, I, I, my wife and son, I said, hey, I wonder, I, when am I going to make these big bucks? You know? <laughs> so, so anyway, so, and it just so happened, uh, I got a letter from, uh, at the time it was called Waterloo Lutheran University in Waterloo, now called Wilfrid Laurier now. And they wrote, I think, to all indigenous graduates across the country, asking them if they would want to come to Waterloo to study for a master's degree in social work. And I looked at the thing and I looked at what they were looking for criteria. And my wife and I spoke about that because I was quite concerned with uh, the ones I was representing. A lot of them just wanted to plead guilty. A lot of them just want to get over with, pay a fine, or what the heck, if I can't pay the fine, I'll go to jail on the weekend or something like that. There was absolutely no rehabilitation back then, you know, other than make sure you behave yourself. And uh, so, but I was, I was kind of bothered by that. And I said, gee, you know, there's no probation officers that go to our reserves and all this, there's no, nothing there. So, so my wife and I spoke about, it. I said, I asked, I said, look, do you mind if I, I go to social work? I said, to find out the other dynamic, how come this happens to people? So she was in full support of that. So, uh, so what happened is I told the 
I told the um, the lawyer I was with, I said, look, I'm going to go study two more years at university in Ontario. Uh, and and he said, well, good. He said, when you're done, you want to come back and with law, you, you're more than welcome to be here. And uh, so um, it just so happened that the Union of New Brunswick Indians, which was in its early stages at the time, uh, had received a federal grant. They needed a lawyer to go talk about the Indian Act to the people in the community. Well, uh, my brother who was working there, he says, well, why don't you come work for us? And, uh, and I said, well, I'm going to go to school in the, in the fall. He says, well, well, this is just a grant. We, we, we've got to start using it. And it'll be, I'm sure you'll have it all spent <laughs> in the end of August when you, when you go to school. So I got there and uh, I moved to Fredericton. And uh, actually, my wife was expecting our second child then. And so we settled in Fredericton and I took some courses at St. Thomas, just what, you know, what the course in psychology and sociology and statistics, all this stuff, just so I would be prepared when I went to the fall. And then I went traveling to all the communities in our province uh, and uh, talking about treaty rights, talking about land claims, doing some research for them, and, uh, and then dealing with government policies a little bit, but not much. And, uh, and people would say, well, gee, can you defend us? You know, I said, well, yeah, I guess I could. Uh, but because I was, I was full time, I was full time as lawyer, I paid full time. So. There were no problems finding clients. <laughs> People didn't have too much money and they couldn't afford lawyers. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll do what I can. So I got involved in the representation and the like family court. Back then the family court was sort of like in a provincial court level, child custody cases. And, uh, and then of course, a lot of criminal offenses and offenses for like motor vehicle liquor control and fisheries and all this stuff. So. So, uh, but then I, I went to university in the fall and uh, that was another great learning experience. Uh, again, very limited courses I had heard in about psychology, sociology, and human behavior, but I was kind of intrigued by it. And uh, what they did in Laurier at the time was uh, you would go to school four months, so it was sort of September to December. And in the winter semester, you were put in a field placement and so uh, not far from Waterloo is Guelph Correctional Center, which is a, was a provincial institution, like a provincial jail for anybody sentenced two years less a day. And so I went, they wanted me to go there. And because there were a high percentage of indigenous inmates at that, at that institution, so I went to go speak to the social worker there and the psychologist. And uh, they said, oh yeah, we'd like to have you in here because uh, the, the indigenous uh, inmates would have somebody that they could really talk to. I said, oh, okay. So, so <laughs> I went there and, and uh, I, I, I tell you, wow, what a, what a change for me to see. I mean, I had represented our own people in courts. Once they were sentenced, you never see them again until they're recharged or whatever. So I went in there and these young men came from all over Ontario and out of a population, prison population about the, uh, 600 to 800, they varied time of the year. About 10% within indigenous people from Ontario, from all over the regions. Uh, and so uh, I started out in social work, like as talking to them and all this stuff. But, but then my supervisor says, I want you to go right into the actual cell block with these guys and get to know them so they can trust you. I said, oh, okay. I was nervous as old, <laughs> <to come there. laughs> but I did. I did, and uh, I was there two hours, and it was kind of interesting. The first night I was with them, like I, I as I said, uh, I was nervous. I mean, you know, and, uh, so when I went down there, they all gathered, you know, they're smoking cigarettes, telling stories, I suppose. So I'm kind of, I got up in the middle and says, who are you? Well, I won't, I won't, I'll they welcomed me in their own way, you know? <laughs> and I said, oh, well, my name is Brady Nicholas. What are you doing? What are you in here for? Because sometimes get, prisoners get transferred in the middle of the night. I said, well, actually, I'm here to help you. Okay, when can we get out? <laughs> I said, well, uh, that's not up to me. I said, oh, I'm just here as a, I told them who I was. Oh, New Brunswick, where is that? So, but what actually broke the ice for us is, it's a good thing I still had my language. And so the ones who were, uh, say, uh, Anishinaabe and uh, Cree, or even like uh, Haudenosaunee, 
there are similar words that we have. So for about an hour and a half, we start sharing words. What the word for this, word for that. And there are a lot of common words actually we have. And then, then finally the guy says, opens the door, lock, uh, unlocks the door says, okay, Nicholas, time to go, you know? So, so anyway, I, I told, I, he said, when are you gonna come back to see us again? I said, well, would you like me to come back? Sure, we'd like to, you know, stuff. So, so all of a sudden then, uh, my uh, responsibilities changed. Rather than going to work at eight in the morning and leaving at four, my supervisor says, you come in at one o'clock and don't leave until nine. So it shifted. And so I, I would spend more time with these guys, you know, and, and uh, so I got to know their stories, where they were from, the difficulties they were in. I didn't dare tell them my career. <laughs> I had a law degree because they'd say, well, this lawyer wasn't no good. The judge was even worse and all this stuff. So <laughs> I don't think they ever knew I was. I never told them I was a lawyer. I know that. So uh, so then as it happened, uh, I could understand then uh, the nature of sentencing when you're sentenced, when, how, how your time and about rehabilitation. And I, I realized the many barriers that are there as well. But these young men, I... Uh, they were very, very good, well behaved. And they said, well, can you supervise us? I said, for what? They said, we'd like to play full or hockey, but nobody wants to supervise us. I said, well, let me ask the authorities if I could. I said, where do you play floor hockey? She said, gymnasium. I said, oh, okay, all right. So, I mean, I wasn't acquainted with all the surroundings. <laughs> so then I went to approach, I said, yeah, sure, get them. And these guys are muscled up and strong. I mean, they don't back down from one another. So I said, okay. You go play floor hockey and they're rough and tumble. I said, I'm just going to sit on stage. And I said, but I'll tell you one thing. Don't shoot that ball at me. <laughs> but if you would, that'll be the last night you'll have this thing. So they were very respectful that way. And so they just played, what, two and a half hours or whatever it was. And then there was all time to go. And that was just on a certain night a week. And then they said, well, could we, they have some musical instruments. Could you arrange us to, We'd like to learn how to play the guitar. I said, oh, okay. All right. So I asked the authorities and they said, well, we really don't have anybody who can instruct them in guitar. I said, well, back at the marriage students' corners in the Waterloo where I go, I know a guy there who, who knows how to play guitar. I'll ask him if he would like to come and teach these guys. So I approached them and they said, geez, I don't know. I said, no, listen, listen I'll be there with you. Don't worry. He says, you're no help. I said, <laughs> I said no, don't worry. They'll, 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 they'll respect you. So, and I said, plus you get a chance to earn some money, which is pretty good for any student, right? And so he came with me and I'll tell you, I never saw so many young men so, uh, so gifted to play guitar and make songs and sing songs. Wow, so that was, that was amazing, incredible. So that was, that was another night. So you play floor hockey <laughs> music. And then after a while they said, um, is it possible for us to have visitors here? You mean like family? I said, gee, some of you come from many areas. Said, well, no, it'd be good. And uh, I think at the time in Ontario, there were these friendship centers, which were located like in London, Kitchener, and uh, Hamilton and Toronto. So I said, well, let me see what I can do. Can you have to go through the uh, bureaucracy? And they finally said, yeah, okay. So. I said, okay, I'll invite the group. First, first one was from Toronto. And uh, I said, okay, so, and I told the guys, I said, look, all right, they're all women. I said, so you have to make sure that, first of all, you behave yourself, you, you respect them, and no foul language. Any of that stuff happens. Uh, again, the authorities have told me, look, it'll stop. Them. And geez, you talk about well behaved gentlemen, I can tell you. But it was good for them because. Through these members of the Friendship Center, they could communicate with their families because they wanted to let their families know where they were. Their families probably didn't even know where they were. What, how are they doing? And, and that was, I'll tell you, that was amazing. And so each week we'd get a different, different uh, uh, members of the uh, uh, Friendship Centers come. And that was socializing. In other words, they would have contact with the outside world. So then all of a sudden, uh, the spring term is done and I have to leave. So, but I enjoyed that very much. I learned so much about um, these young guys. Uh, I didn't look at them as inmates anymore. They were human beings just like I did. Sometimes, uh, unfortunately, they made unfortunate mistakes, but 
you know, they're paying the price for that. And uh, not that much help at the time was given to them for actual rehabilitation other than, you know, uh, we'll protect society by taking them off the street. But that had a dramatic impact on me later on when I was a judge, actually, in 91, of, of when I was studying somebody. So anyway, so that was it. And uh, spring terms, five weeks or whatever it was. And then I came back to New Brunswick to work some more. And uh, again, I, I'm glad because I had a chance to earn some money uh, dealing with the same thing or what I did before in Indian Africa and all these research that were going. And then in the fall, I was actually sent up to a place called Waboden, Manitoba uh, to deal with the young, young students who did not want to go to school uh, in grade eight because they would have had to leave their communities. So I was sent there. It was a uh, Métis communities and some indigenous communities as well along what they call the, 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 the Bay Line, they call it, because it was, it was just a railroad track that would run through their communities. And so I would win, go into these communities, meet with these young, young men, young, young boys, young girls, I guess, grade eight. And, and, uh, and I would just say, well, look, you know, uh, if you want to stay in your community, then, you know, spend as much time as you can with your elders. Um, it's a darn good thing I never recommended them to go to schools because they still would have had residential schools in those areas, either at DePauw or elsewhere. And, uh, you know, when you think about it after the devastating uh, consequences that took place, there was, there was no knowledge really of that at the time, uh, at least not, not as public as we have it now. So, but I was there four months and uh, I had a chance to go to uh, different Northern communities. Like I remember going to Norway house one time for, for a meeting. And, uh, and this is when I saw a traveling court. You know, the, the court would come into the community, in the play would be a judge, prosecutor, uh, legal aid, the prisoner, the RCMP and everything, everybody flowing to the community. And I was at another, I was happened to be staying in the same hotel as the, uh, as uh, the uh, people involved in the administration of justice. And uh, they probably had a, maybe a cell maybe or something like that, I imagine for the ones who were accused. So, and so I was, oh, oh gee, that's a thing that they fly everybody in here and have a, wow, that's, that's a, in my mind, I'm thinking, gee, this is amazing. And uh, speaking of New Brunswick, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so then uh, I was finished there in December, 2000, 2000 no, in 19, uh, 1973. And then the winter semester was um, 1974. And, and uh, actually, I had a job lined up with the Ontario Correctional Services because uh, by then, after I graduated, I had a master's in social work and a law degree. And we said, we need somebody at, the, uh, at this level to help shape policy or work. And I said, well, let me consider it, you know? And, and, and it just so happened that uh, my brother, who was, who was a chief, um, from uh, from my uh, community, uh, said uh, he came up to see me in Waterloo. My brother Dennis, you know, and, and said, "Oh, what's going on? Not often you have a brother come from that distance come and see you." <laughs> he said, "Well, I want you to come back and work for us and on the reserve." I said, "Oh, well, what?" He says, "I need legal advisor." I said, "Oh, what's going on?" He said, "Well, uh, we have a major land claim for our community, and." Uh, the minister at the time was Jean Chrétien, if you can believe that. Anyway, Jean Chrétien finally said, okay, we will give money to the community so they can begin to prepare for their land claim. And I said, yeah. I said, well, my wife said, yes, we have got to New Brunswick because it's originally from St. John. And so I had to tell the Ontario people, not sorry like that, that we're going back home. Uh, and uh, so we settled in Fredericton. And so I started working with our community as a legal advisor and all that stuff. And looking at all the different land issues in our community. It wasn't just the land claim, there were other, other like there was higher lines and easements that were never looked after and all this stuff. And so I said, yeah, I can handle this. Well, I think it was about three weeks into the actual program. Uh, my brother said, uh, uh, gee, you know, the money we were promised from the government is not going to come forth. I said, why? He said, well, they don't like the fact that I hired my brother who was a lawyer. You know, 
I said, well, I said, I suppose there's a federal regulation for that. I said, that's okay, don't worry. I mean, I'm, I'm in Fredericton. I've got two professional degrees, social work and law. Surely to goodness I can find jobs in one of these things. And, uh, and I, it, but he felt really bad, you know. I said, don't feel bad. I said, look, you know, uh, my wife's happy. Her, her, her parents are not that far away and uh, our kids are getting settled in. And I said, no, don't worry about that, I'll be okay. Then I'm thinking, oh, geez, what am I gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was on a Thursday. And that following Friday afternoon, I just happened to be going for a coffee. And I met a friend I used to, I, he was the guy who was managing the program and uh, writes and treatises and doing research. He says, oh, how's it going? I said, well, it was going pretty good until yesterday. So I explained to him the situation. He says, well, you're lucky. He says, we're just going to get a huge grant from the uh, federal government. It's the rights and treatise uh, research program that they're doing. And he says, we need a lawyer. I said, oh, you are? Well, geez, here's one right now. <laughs> so that's how I got this job. Uh, I'm starting Monday morning. And, uh, and then, of course, what, from there, 1974 until I left in 1998, that's what I did, uh, dealing with all, all of our rights in our province, dealing with hunting, fishing rights, trapping rights, our treaty of rights, some land claims, uh, some family court cases, and from youth court case, that, all that stuff, you know, it was... Plus, being a political advisor, <laughs> I'll tell you, it was, uh, uh, again, you know, because you're a lawyer full time, everybody thinks, okay, hey, we got a lawyer, you know, so I got this case or that case. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it was a very rich experience for me. And uh, I loved it. I loved it. Uh, I like to work hard and whatever I learned in law and all this stuff. And what, actually, the beauty of social work that was being trained to be an analyst of public policy, writing public policy, looking at background material, research on this and that of policy. So, so that really trained me really well. And um, so I, I don't know, I enjoyed it very much. It was just at the end, uh, back then they would call it burnout, but I think I just, I uh, was saying, gee, you know, uh, I'm working like crazy. Uh, you know, my, um, my wife, she, she was, uh, she was a lawyer as well later and our sons are by now they're almost finishing high school so i said well you know i guess i, I see what I, I can do that's that's what it was and uh, i ended up going actually uh, at st thomas university which is probably where i was working full-time with the university in uh 19 i started in january 1989 until 1991 when i got that call to be a judge so if, uh, but I started teaching courses at St. Thomas actually in 1984, 83, 84, I'm trying to remember which year, uh, because they did have a native studies program. And uh, I was the only one who could, who was asked to organize a course on indigenous law, what we call it, natives and the law one, natives and the law two, yeah. land claims. So, so I got a chance to create those courses and then teach part-time. But the thing is I had to teach part-time at nighttime because, mm -hmm. um, busyness of work, I, it was sort of like Monday night, seven o'clock till 10 kind of a thing, you know, which is kind of, uh, as I think of it now, boy, that was, must be hard around the students. <laughs> but but that's, that's how it worked out, you know? So it was a very enriching uh, uh, path actually. And, and, lo and I still love teaching, I'm still teaching even now. No, it, it was, it, I benefited from it because you were teaching just at that period when I was in my native studies degree and I was pregnant with my first son. So all I had to do was just study and be a keener and I would come to class in the evening and you would come in with your grocery bags <laughs> full of papers and handouts to hand out. Some of the grocery bags looked like they'd been used a hundred times, <laughs> but you were like, oh, waste not, want not. So every night and we would have these most amazing discussions about yeah. the law and you were just yeah. you were so good at it you were just so good at relating to people and you really inspired me I thought wow he's not at all what I pictured lawyers were because to me <laughs> you know lawyers were intimidating you only saw them when people were in trouble they were usually with the police you know it was so it wasn't a good thing but you were just and I learned, and that's why I learned a whole bunch of things that I didn't know before either, you know, like land rights and the Indian Act and constitutional things, you know, related to Native people. And I was just like, how could I have not known that? 
because I came from an activist family who's very organized, but you just can't know everything. Yeah. So I, I feel very lucky that in that little time period, um, you know, I got to take that class from you and you were the one who said, you know, right before I went to have my son, you were like, you know, you should really consider law school. Well, you're and, a great student, you know, and uh, I've had a number of students I encouraged a long way to do that. And uh, I, I'm not sure if I would have shared with you my experience in Geneva uh, on the early stages of the uh, United Declarations on Rights of Indigenous People that we have now. But in 1983, like we, we were as an organization and, and throughout this country, struggling on the, the recognition of treaty and Aboriginal rights and Aboriginal title. Uh, you, you know, we, we, had, we had some cases that were good, uh, but uh, the, the thing was, the, that was the time when they're talking about patriation and all this stuff. And for myself as a political leader at the time, I said, we can't trust the government. You know, they're gonna pick and choose. First of all, our treaties were made between nations. Mm -hmm. In other mm -hmm. words, we're, we're nations and uh, the crown was represented. To a nation, and uh, so under, under I never studied international law, but because I had gone to Geneva, started to go to Geneva and reading this stuff, the criteria for a nation is number one is you have to have a population. Secondly, is you have to have a form of government, you have to have a language, and you have to have a territory and be able to uh, interact with others. So the definition of a nation. It, the Wallistic Wigan Nation, the Mi'kmaq Nation, the Cree Nation, the Anishinaabe Nation, Haudenosaunee, all across this land, uh, we were nations. And uh, so, and I had read the decisions of the United States Supreme Court in the 1830s, the 1820s, 1830s, when Chief Justice Marshall was dealing with these treaties that the United States inherited uh, from the British. And they themselves signed treaties with the different tribes, Cherokee Nation, there's Creek and other nations as well. So when these were being contested because of conflict between state governments and the federal government of the United States, they had to litigate this stuff. Even though I don't think we had any, no, I don't think there was any uh, Native American uh, lawyers back then or anything like that, but the courts at that time said the words sovereignty, the words nationhood, the words nation, those are our terms in the, in, in the English language. That's not necessarily the language that the tribes would have. However, we had to treat them as nations by signing treaties. So we have to recognize their uh, sovereignty, their nationhood and their jurisdiction. And so I was, uh, you know, I said, wow, this, this is amazing. I, I'd never, I had never uh, read that kind of law, although I had a little bit of it when I, 1969, but not fully. And uh, so I started to, uh, when we would gather, you know, Pam, back in the, I'd say mid seventies, say about 70, 76 to 78, 79, across Canada, there were no more than about 10 of us indigenous who were lawyers. You know, think of Leroy Little Bear, Wilton Little Child, and, uh, the, and, and I'm trying to think of the guy's name, his name was, his last name is Young. Uh, from uh, from Manitoba. Oh, Ken oh. Young. Ken Young, young Ken Young, and uh, and also like Joe Muskook, Joe uh, Matthias from, uh, and Bill Wilson. Th those guys have gone to law school, not really practicing law, but they were involved in the political movement. Mm -hmm. So uh, we would and uh, so we would meet the, the at that at the time the National League Brotherhood. The president was Noel Star Blanket, and my brother Dennis was the vice president. So they would gather us young Indigenous legal minds and. And we would meet with our uh, counterparts from the United States, from the Native Americans, because there were quite a few Native American lawyers actually in the United States. And so we began to discuss all these concepts of sovereignty, nationhood, jurisdiction, self-determination, uh, judicial systems. And wow, this was a real major uh, experience for me. I said, holy God, that is something. So, so once I learned from them and I said, well, we're no different. Maybe it's not practiced in our particular uh, community, but I know for sure there are trees because uh, we've been going to courts with this stuff. So that opened up a whole new thing for me. And uh, so in 19, uh, uh, I'll just give a little bit of background. See, uh, the case that kind of 
was like a shadow over all treaty and indigenous rights in the Maritimes was this Sillaboy case, which was decided by a deputy uh, provincial judge, uh, magistrate actually back in Cape Breton in 1928. In essence, the treaty of 1752, he said was not valid. It, and when it was signed in 1752, Cape Breton was still part of Acadia and not part of Nova Scotia. So it doesn't apply there. And the one who was accused was actually the Grand Chief of the Mi'kmaq. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sillaboy himself was a Grand Chief of the Mi'kmaq and, and, and he was just exercising his right to, to hunt, fish and trap. And he was found guilty. And, and so the sort of barriers from that very beginning, unfortunately, was number one, the treaty was not valid because they said there were outbreaks of hostilities in Halifax and there were supposed to be peace and friendship treaties. The second thing is he said, there's no way that Mr. Silboy can trace himself back to that document, even if it's valid, in order to be beneficiary. So that continued to affect uh, all the Atlantic with respect to the, we have a number of treaties that we signed, peace and friendship treaties. You know, first of all, being 1725. And strangely enough, that treaty was signed in Boston <laughs> and, and then brought up to Halifax for sort of like ratification later on, 1726. But but uh, representatives from, from our tribe were there. And, and so we had the same problem here in New Brunswick about the hunting, fishing and trapping rights, the genealogy part. So we were able to find the documents and these treaty documents were spread out in Nova Scotia, Halifax, Ottawa, all over the place. It's a darn good thing we had a good strong research and department that went to found these documents and then you get you look at the original one, see what they look like, and and uh, and then, but yeah, the genealogy we always had a problem, and it just so happened. You know, it's like I say, sometimes you know the creator looks after us real good, and uh, we had a, a woman by the name of Marjorie Pearlie. She was from our community, and she was interested in research and had uh, received a Ford Foundation fellowship way back in the seventies. Ford Foundation in the United States decided that they would donate so much money to, to Native Americans, which would include First Nations in our country. So she got a grant from them to do some work. So she was interested in wampum belts and whether wampum belts were used here in this area or not. And so she happened to go to uh, East Clear First Nation, which is called Village now, a village. And she was talking to the priest there and the priest said, well, look, you know, I'll, I don't know anything about wampum belt, but here you can have a copy of this. And the copy uh, was birth records, baptismal records, death certificates, marriage licenses and everything uh, from uh, 1700 and I forget the date, 1763 or something like that. So she brought it to our, uh, brought it to our, uh, well, neither, none of us could really read French. And we said, well, geez, what would we do? What would we do here with this document? Uh, so we, uh, Do Knockwood, who was Mi'kmaq from Dorchester, from Fort Folly First Nation, said, I know a guy, Stephen White. He's at the Acadian Archives at the University of Moncton. And I'll take this to him and see if he can help us. Well, he went to see Steve White. And Steve was so, uh, he's so grateful for seeing, because they had never had that kind of a document just on the indigenous people and the church, even if it was in French, because the missionaries were all French back then, and the names were all in French at the time. So, so he said, this is a record we never knew existed as part of an Acadian uh, system. He said, so Joe said, well, here's our problem. He's, he said, with this link and the other we have here, I can in fact trace your people back to the 1600s. And of course, we know the first baptism was 1610, right? Grand Chief Member too. And he said, we've got all the records. And what was kind of, so he got to be our expert witness. Now, Steve White, his family way, way back in 1755, were displaced Acadians and sent down for like Louisiana or somewhere down there. And eventually they changed their name to White. Now, LeBlanc is, is white in English. So they changed their name from LeBlanc to White. And so he was brought up in the educational system in the United States, eventually found out his uh, Acadian identity and 
got hired by the Acadian Archives in, at the University of Moncton. And, uh, you know, 300 and some odd years later. <laughs> so, anyway, so so he he was really good. I mean, that's the expert witness we needed, really. It was amazing. So then, uh, because the province of New Brunswick, uh, the Attorney General did not recognize our rights at all, and Hatfield, who was a premier, he was just, I don't know. Uh, I guess I have to be generous in my old days, what I say, <laughs> but it was a challenge for us because he had said in 1970 to the chiefs gathered in Edmonston, you know, this when he became premier, right? And defeated Louis Robichaud. And the chief, I think it was Anthony Francis, who at the time was, was the president of the union, I think, and other, other people who were there, they told the premier, premier, we've got treaty rights. Atfield, even though he was a lawyer, never heard of treaty rights. So what do you mean treaties? He said, well, we've got treaties and we're finding this stuff and uh, they apply to this province. And, and Hatfield pulled the gather chiefs at the time, 1970. If you can prove to me in a court of law in New Brunswick that there is a treaty, it's valid, I'll be the first one to stand up in New Brunswick and say, hey, we have to respect these things. So the challenge was issued. So when I came on to the Union of New Brunswick in this whole time in 1974, this was one of the things on my lap. And so we did a lot of research. And, and so finally, we had this case called the Gregory Paul case. Gregory Paul was from, uh, a, well, back then it was called uh, Red Bank, but now it's Metapanagiak. And Gregory Paul was Mi'kmaq from his community and he had trapped a beaver in springtime and was gonna go down to the fur dealer in uh, Mermachi and sell it. So he put the pelt up, stretched out on his pickup truck and drove to the town. Stopped in for a cup of coffee and just happened to be where game wardens were <laughs> having coffee too. <laughs> so, so the game warden says, holy cow, what do you got there anyway? Gregory, he said, oh geez, I got a nice beaver pelt. Oh, this is, that was good sized beaver. What are you gonna do with that? I'm gonna go sell to the fur dealer. Down, you know, with the, the Douglas town. They said, do you have a permit or license to issue to transport that? Gregory Paul says, I don't need one. The Union of New Brunswick Indians says we've got treaty rights, we've got the right to trap, and I'm going down there. I don't need anything from the province. So they charged them. They charged them for uh, transporting beaver pelt without a license from the Fish and Wildlife Act, I think of New Brunswick, or Rehemus Act, whatever it was called at the time. So he came knocking on our door. <laughs> he said, Well, I need your help. This is what he told our crew, right? And he says, what is it? So we listened to him and, and um, we said, yeah, we'll defend you. We'll defend you. We're waiting for a test case. And so sure enough, we went to court and, and, and we, we said, we're going, to, we're going to test the treaties. We're going to put all of them in there, you know, right from 1725 to 1779, which was the last one that the Mi'kmaq would have signed in. Windsor, Nova Scotia at the time, but it applied to that area of our province. <laughs> and and uh, I told Gregory, I said, Gregory, we're going to lose this at the trial and possibly back then the county court level and maybe even in the court of appeal. But I think this case may go all the way to Supreme Court Canada. So are you prepared to uh, wait that long? It might take seven years. He says, well, if you say I've got the right, okay. So we went on that basis of of uh, making an agreement with the prosecutor because we both wanted to know how valid these treaties are. So we agreed that Gregory Paul, in fact, did trap the beaver on his reserve, that he's a registered Indian under the Indian Act, and that there are these treaties that would come into play for a defense under the Federal Indian Act, Section 88 or 87 at the time, I think. So sure enough, we went to the trial level and guilty. Uh, you know, the provincial court just saying, as well, Indians should be any different than anybody else. They're in the province of New Brunswick. And uh, so uh, I, but I told Greg, I said, well, I told you we'd lose. We're going to go to the county court next. So I put the appeal in for a county court judge. And the county court judge was from Moncton. He came up, we had the hearing scheduled. And then he asked uh, the county prosecutor for myself to go into his office. So we went in there and he said, I don't want to hear this case. I said, what do you mean you want to hear this case? The, the next level of the judiciary is you, a county court judge. He said, yeah, but as a county court judge, I don't have to hear it. I want to refer this directly to the Court of Appeal. 
because that's where one of you guys are going to take it anyway, isn't it? Well, it's just true. We, we lose. The car said, yeah, we lose. we're going to take it there too. He says, okay, I'm going to make a reference directly to the Court of Appeal. And so they did. And so uh, this was my first big moment to go in front of the Court of Appeal of New Brunswick, you know. And so uh, we put the appeal in and submitted, you know, your documentation, your arguments ahead of time. And uh, we got up to, uh, we got up to, uh, I had to go because the appellant, my factor was there and everything. But then they said, okay, Mr. Nicholas, what is it you have to say? So I got up, start to make my arguments. Chief Justice says, just a minute before you begin. He says, how do we know as judges of the Court of Appeal of New Brunswick that Mr. Paul, the one you represent, is in fact, can connect himself to the treaties that you are putting, that were here part of the evidence. His genealogy, right? I said, well, my Lord, so I said, this was an agreed statement of fact that uh, that the Crown Prosecutor and myself would agree to. Uh, we want to test the law to find out are these trees valid or not for recognition of hunting, fishing, and trapping rights. They said, well, there's nothing on the record here that's been sent up by the uh, provincial court, the North County Court judge. I said, well, gee, we we're signing an agreed statement of fact. And it's a darn good thing the Crown Prosecutor said, I've got a copy of them right here. And so handed over to this and, and then this, okay, let's hear your argument then. So I made my argument. And uh, and then um, the Crown Prosecutor responded. And then what happens as an appellant at the end, do you have a chance to make a rebuttal? So I was looking at the clock and I saw one of the judges keep looking at the clock and all this stuff. And I said, oh, this is five to 12. I said, oh, I better not say too much because maybe he's hungry. Oh no, or whatever. <laughs> so I said, well, uh, no, I just would say that uh, whatever my factum has, what, what I put in my arguments, uh, they're sufficient here for, uh, for your lordships to decide the case one way or the other. <clears throat> and so we're recessed. That would have been in sort of like October, I think, of one year. And then I got a letter the following year. This strange letter, you know, the letter said, the court cannot make a decision. So this would have been in 70, I'd say it would have been in 79, fall of 79. And they needed more, more information. Well, in, when that happens, you have to let the Crown know and then you submit whatever documentation you need to the court so that uh, in terms of proof, uh, court system, you, you do that. So I submitted a whole bunch of stuff, made a copy of the crown. So the decision was finally made in um, June of 1980, the Gregory Paul case, and he was acquitted. Uh, all three judges said not guilty. Uh, one, two of the judges, the chief justice and another judge said, because of the treaty of 1779, uh, which, it, which recognized actually hunting, fishing, trapping rights, Within, within their district, that was the word used. Unfortunately, they interpreted district to say they are current current uh, Indian reserve, like Madapanaga. It didn't expand off the reserve. In the, uh, and uh, I was disappointed with that, but my client was found not guilty. So then the other, um, the other judge uh, ruled that not guilty because of all the treaties that had been signed. So I, but they said his was actually, uh, uh, you know, not part of the major, major decision. It was sort of like a dissent. It really wasn't, but that's how they interpreted it. So again, not guilty. So, so Gregory says, we won. I said, well, we won, that's true. However, uh, when a decision is made this time of year in June, the province has uh, 90 days to file a, Notice of appeal to Supreme Court of Canada. So we will have to wait some more. So, um, and I was hoping, I, yeah, I hope this case goes to Supreme Court of Canada. You know, it's, uh, we've never had a case of this kind that's been held by the court, and, but the province decided not to appeal it. For whatever reason they had, I mean, they, they had the reasons, and you don't question that. My client was happy. All he wanted, he said, well, when, when can I get my beaver belt back? Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, I don't know. We'll have to. So the chiefs were scheduled to meet with uh, with Premier Hatfield 
And uh, they told them, I said, well, we finally won a case. And the province not going to appeal it. So whatever Hatfield promised you in 1970, uh, they said, okay. So we went to a meeting with the premier and I forget the people of his cabinet members, maybe, in the Centennial Building. And I remember Chief Albert Levi saying, look at uh, Mr. Premier. In 1970, I was just a new chief in State Cove. Now it's also booked out that time it's open. You challenged us that we should have a we should have a treaty we could prove in the court in New Brunswick and, and you would accept it. Hatfield's response would be that that's only one Indian. It doesn't apply to everyone else. So obviously his whoever his minister of justice or attorney general must have figured, okay. Uh, so, oh gee, you know, I mean, there was, people were mad and upset inside that chambers. And um, so I remember uh, Albert Levi saying, Chief Levi, he said, Mr. Premier, this is what you told us in Edmonton. And now you're saying, no, he says, the word's going to come out to our hunters tonight. They're going to start hunting. There'll be about a thousand of them. You don't have enough court space. You don't have enough judges. But we're going to defend each and every one of them. Goodbye. That meeting stopped. Every day for about 100 reaches. That was it, you know. So, see, I know the Hatfield at the time. We never told them we had this expert testimony of Stephen White. Uh, that's before disclosure rolls. But... They never told us what they did as well. So sure enough, we got another case, uh -huh. cases. And this time we had Stephen White testify as an expert with our treatise and the, the acquittals started and it was on reserve and off reserve. So we were able to, that was, I think probably, you know, when you stop and think in 1980 uh, and then subsequent cases we had, um, this is why our chiefs in New Brunswick did not trust Hatfield at the first minister's conferences. Why should he have anything to say about our identification of our treaty and Aboriginal rights when he, back in the home province, he couldn't care less. So we, based on that, our, um, uh, as the chiefs of New Brunswick and the Indian Association of Alberta and the um, chiefs of Nova Scotia uh, uh, went to issue a court case in London that tried to stop the patriation process. Now it was very unpopular for other political leaders, indigenous political leaders in this country because they said, well, you know, we've got section 35, which is says, okay, ex existing treaty and Aboriginal rights are hereby recognized. Um, but we didn't trust the language and we certainly did not mm -hmm. trust premiers across this country to be telling us what our treaty and Aboriginal rights are. That's probably the same thing now, I don't know, but this is what it was kind of a, so because of that experience, this is why then um, the Grand Chief of the Mi'kmaq, you know, John Marshall Sr., and I knew him, you know, well, we all knew one another back then. It was because we met as Maritime Chiefs, Atlantic Chiefs, and Listigush came and be with us. And uh, so uh, uh, Donald Sr. said, great, and I want you to go to Geneva, Switzerland. I said, for what? He said, well, they're having meetings there about indigenous peoples from around the world. So I want you to go there. So I was, I said, Don, I have great respect for you. However, and this was probably my mistake. I said, however, I work for the chiefs of New Brunswick. And um, we had a dinner break. After dinner, the chiefs of New Brunswick said, great, and we got to meet with you. I said, okay. So and he says, we don't like the way you talk to the Grand Chief Donald Marshall Senior. He's a good man. I said, yeah, I know he's a good man. And he, so you you're gonna go to Geneva. I said, You want me to go to Geneva <laughs> in the summer of 1983, right? <laughs> I said, uh, what do you want me to say? What you've been telling us all along? That we can't trust governments that are treaty rights. And I said, Yeah, okay. I said, uh, see, because the reason why, because I was, as part of an organization, because I was president then, I had to be conscious of money. 
and we just did not have money to send great necklace over to Geneva, Switzerland. And I thought to myself, well, if Nova Scotia wants me to go there, let them dip into their coffers to help me pay for my expenses. Uh, and But anyway, I was told to go and I said, okay, I'll go. I'll have to find out how to get there. And, um, but Donald Marshall Sr. said, we want you to go there and tell us what's happening. We're hearing that somebody is representing us over there. I said, oh, I didn't know that. So, so to get to a United Nations meeting in Geneva, you have to have, um, uh, you have to have an organization, you know, uh, NGO, what they call non-governmental organization, who's got uh, recognition by the United Nations to go and uh, speak there, because you can't just go there and speak. So to find an organization, uh, through my contacts with others, uh, the, it was the um, uh, North American Indian Treaty Council from New York, based in New York, but I mean, you know, in the United States. And I approached them and I said, look, is there any way that I could come under your kind of sponsorship as an NGO, participate in this? So she says, okay, just send us to your particulars. We'll, we'll get you the credentials. So sure enough, I, I got to go to uh, Geneva this, in August, I think, maybe July or something. Like that. They used to call it Indian Summer in Geneva. It was just yeah. a one of these yeah. session, bringing indigenous representatives from around the world and uh, making presentations. So I learned, well, you have to write stuff up in case you don't complete the stuff. You need your file it there, at least the material will be there. So once, uh, so I prepared documentation for our, like the Big Mama and the Willisca Week uh, in the Maritimes. And he, I agreed that I could do it. And uh, I'm not sure if Willisca was really gave me permission or not because uh, the Mi'kmaq there, there were three. And, and But anyway, they said, oh, okay, you'll go. And, and we all have the same treaties and all that stuff. So I prepared a submission. I went there. And um, at the time, there were probably, I'll say 70, 75 representatives, indigenous organizations from around the world who would gather there and just for one week. And so it was in its preliminary stages um, of uh, trying to deal with uh, the standards that the uh, United Nations would try to develop. And then secondly was also what's, what's happening in the, in the different uh, jurisdictions, different states. So uh, I went there and made my submission. I had, no kidding, eight minutes is all you had to speak, that was it. And so the government of Canada representative came in and contradicted everything. They said, oh, we're helping, oh, we're good and all this stuff. But, and they had unlimited time. But that was each indigenous organization from around the world was like that. And uh, so they say, well, okay, they're indigenous populations. And uh, so, but from that, I got, you make linkages with others, you know? And uh, so not only for those in, in our part of the world, the Americas, but also different ones from Australia, New Zealand, and in, at, at different places, Scandinavia country and all that stuff. So. So anyway, second year I went back. Again, it was just for um, just for a week, but I was better organized, and I made sure I made copies when I went there, so I could distribute them widely. And uh, then you you start developing more connections. And then I spoke to uh, I spoke to uh, some tribes from BC who had supported me, and from Alberta and Manitoba, and uh, they started to go there. And then also some from Quebec and Ontario. And so networking began. And uh, so I think in 85, uh, of course I ran a national chief then I got trounced, so I didn't go that way. <laughs> but, uh, but in 87, I went back and in 88, in 87, there was a two week. In and by then there were 350 people who would come from representative voices from around the world. Mm -hmm. And so that was the genesis actually of the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So this is where you hear the words about nationhood, sovereignty, self-determination, uh, land rights, every, the whole, what, what, what you see in the document now, those were all discussed at the very beginning. And of course you'd have countries objecting to indigenous voices. They didn't want to recognize us as peoples because they said, if they're peoples, then this thing about nationhood would creep in. They said, no, they're just populations. You know, minority populations in their country. So I got a chance to meet a whole bunch of people there. I learned a whole lot. 
And, uh, but I, I, I retired from the United Nebraska Indians in the fall of 88. And uh, I was just, uh, there was so much on my plate, I think. And then I said, mm -hmm. well, I want to try something else. So that's, and when I read that document in 2007, I couldn't believe it. I said, wow, isn't that something? And uh, even now, uh, uh, there's going to be an attempt by, by, our, by the government and C-15 to try to put this into place. But I don't know how it'll do, maybe. But it's, Canada is still um, does not want to recognize, first of all, land rights. It doesn't want to fully recognize. It tries to impose a uh, uh, consultant, which is well, a legal terminology that the Supreme Court have talked about, but it doesn't give the full consent that our nations have. So, um, but anyway, it's that's that's what it was. And uh, gosh, there's been a lot of water under the bridge, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> You've been at it's so oh, many wow. important points in time. You know, at the National Indian Brotherhood way back when, when you had all of these titans who were like leading the movement on all of these things, you know, at the constitutional talks and those issues. And to be there at the beginnings of what would eventually become UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And then to see all that work, like none of that work and and effort comes with an immediate result like yeah, you right. see it you plant the seeds you do the work and then other people do the work and they carry it forward and you hope that it'll be something someday and like and here it is now it's an international declaration that applies yeah. to the majority of the world's countries and whether or not canada implements it domestically or how it does or you know whether it's this government or another government it's the fact that indigenous peoples got it to where yeah. it is that it's in fact an international document and and you were part of that like that's that's really amazing well, the baby steps of it, I should say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's all important. I mean, and and like you're doing all of this stuff, you know, law and social work and grassroots and politics. And then how on earth did you become a judge? Did you just walk into, <laughs> you know, the chief justice of the, of the bench and just like, oh, hey. <laughs> well, you know, like <laughs> you know, that was quite a thing. I mean, I, first of all, uh, I loved teaching at the University of St. Thomas. I, was, I really enjoyed it. It was relaxing, believe me, compared to the political uh, demands of, of indigenous politicians. You know, it, the demands are so great among our people because the needs are so great. Yeah. And you're always in a very uh, combative stance with the government policies. Now it's complicated with provinces. Uh, but um, uh, so I found teaching to be very relaxing, but I had an opportunity then to teach students such as yourselves and others of what I had experienced, you know, like uh, the richness of our, uh, of our self-determination, mm -hmm. our nationhood, our sovereignty, what, who were, and, you know, and some people sit those in the last day, what is Aboriginal rights? You know, I said, well, Aboriginal rights for me is simple. It's a way of life. It's the way we live before contact mm -hmm. with the, with the uh, colonizers. So that way of life is how we live. We had all these, we had our own systems and everything. So I said, that's a nutshell is what it is, but we have to be creative and go back and be open to what it is. But so I was teaching this and actually I had applied for a grant uh, in 1990 from, uh, from the uh, organization that supports university uh, research. Uh, that back then they called it SHRC. I'm not even sure what yeah. they call it now. But uh, so I applied for a grant, sort of like maybe, I don't know, say $17,000, maybe 20000 at the most, whatever it was. A lot of money back in 1990. So what I was going to do was because of what I had learned from the United States, other uh, indigenous Native American jurists over there, as well as uh, I was interested in examining their tribal court systems. Because um, in our province, I said, well, we've got the Mi'kmaq and the Willistic Week, and they're spread out one by itself may not have enough uh, responsibility. So I said, let me go study the ones in the United States. So my grant was approved and I was supposed to go up to Washington State, Montana State, the smaller ones where they had what, uh, what they would call rotating and traveling tribal courts. In other words, because the reservations were small, the judge would go and uh, and I had seen what was happening in Norway House that time, you know? So, so I, I applied for the grant, got it. And uh, so, however, 
uh, and I had gone to different conferences, you know, on the indigenous issues and uh, uh, been dealing with uh, trying to get our people to develop their own justice systems, I guess. Uh, and so then I got a I got a visit from the Minister of Justice uh, in May 1st, 1991. Jim Lockyer was the guy. And I had met Jim at different conferences. You know, he was, he was on, with the McKenna government at the time. And so he walked in, he said, well, great, I've heard you talk at the conference. Uh, what would you do to improve the, uh, the uh, system in New Brunswick? So, okay, all right. so he, I said, okay, he wants somebody to go and give pictures. <laughs> So I said, well, Jim, here's what I do. I said, first thing, the first point of contact of anyone who's charged is the police. If the police don't know anything about us, don't know our language, our customs or tradition, they're going to make mistakes. Secondly is once a person is going to be charged, you have to take it to a crown prosecutor. And if the crown prosecutor doesn't know anything about her, and, and I knew from hunting fishing traffic cases, that a lot of them didn't know it. So I said, and then that's the next one. I said, then there's a legal aid, because that's the first one that contact. And then you've got the judge, judiciary. And then if somebody's convicted, you know, with you know, all just criminal, not just hunting, just in traffic cases. I said, well, you've got probation involved in their parole and all these. And I said, so you're talking about major, major work here that's gotta be done. I said, um, what else, what else? I said, well, look at, look at yourself, Jim. I said, you're a minister of justice. I said, how much background do you have on indigenous issues? You've gone to many conferences. How much have you learned? Well, I've learned so much. I said, okay, how about your cabinet colleagues? What have they learned? Because they make decisions. Well, not too much, but I said, how about, what, how about the premier? How much does premier Canada know about indigenous rights? So I said, so actually to make changes in the system, people have to know what they're up against. I said, because there've been a number of reports that have been done. I said, the first one was in 1967 called Indians of the Law. And there've been a series of that. I said, making recommendations, beautiful recommendations, but they haven't been implemented. So anyway, we're going like this. And I said, and I said so what do I, I said, well, Jim, what is it you're looking for? <laughs> he says, how would you like to be a provincial court judge? I said, what? <laughs> what do you mean provincial court judge? I said, Jesus, I don't want to be a provincial court judge. I enjoy what I'm doing. I enjoy teaching. I love this. And he says, well, uh, you know, uh, I think the province would like to have an indigenous person as a provincial court judge. I said, well, wow. I said, well, I can't say yes. So when do you need to know? This, uh, and uh, this May 1st was, I think on a Wednesday. And I said, well, gee, I don't know. I'd have to call my wife because she's involved in this if I change, if, because I'm here at the university and full time and uh, I'm gonna start doing some research. And he said, well, Okay, let me know. And so I had to call my wife and say, guess what? We're gonna to have to go get a bite to eat somewhere. I know something serious. She says, what is it? I said, I'll have to wait until after a week and then I'll tell you. <laughs> so anyway, I told her what he was about. He said, oh, where? I said, well, they're gonna send me up to Woodstock. They're gonna send me up to Woodstock for a couple of years, get to know the system and then possibly sit at different areas where First Nations would be tried. It's almost like a, Tribal court system, right? <laughs> tribal, tribal justice, <laughs> tribal in court kind of a thing. And he said, what do you think? I said, Jesus, I don't know. I said, look, I love what I'm doing. I'm not sure whether I'm ready for this or not. And he says, well, I think you are. You're not as uh, combative as you were <laughs> back in the 80s. <laughs> You've mellowed a little bit, you know? And uh, I, so anyway, so, so I agreed. I agreed it would be done. And that, that's how it happened, you know? Like, uh, wow. And then I, um, I got a little bit disappointed about 94, there was no movement. And by then you're changing ministers and all this stuff and different priorities. And you, as a judge, you can't interact with the, with the government officials. But uh, this is when uh, sensing circles started to come about. And so I was increased by that. So uh, I kind of resolved that, okay, all right, I'll continue my career as a judge. And uh, so that was my, that was my intent was to uh, be a judge till I was 65, because only 45 years old, I was appointed as a judge. Oh, wow. And then at 65, you could do what's called supernumerary judge till I would be 75, in which I would just sit as a judge for um, uh, 
40% of the time and the 60% would be my pension. So, but the, between the two, it would be still the full salary. That was my intent until I got that magic call on <laughs> in uh, uh, March of uh, 1990, uh, 19, uh, 1999, when my wife and I were vacationing down in uh, uh, where our son lives in uh, Arizona. <laughs> so <laughs> changed our life completely again. Oh, and and right. for all the listeners who don't know about the magical call, what was the magical call about? <laughs> <laughs> well, what it was, you know, like I was what? I was six, over 63, 64, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm trying to make sure I'm, I'm in the right age here. Uh, and because, uh, yeah, I would have been, I would just turned 63. And uh, 2009, I was looking forward to January 2011, when I could, when I'd reached my 65th birthday. So uh, we're down there vacationing, went to spring training. And then all of a sudden I get this call about, uh, well, I guess it would have been 9.30 here, but 5.30 out there, wake up call to Great Nicholas, yes, Judge Nicholas, yes. Who is this? Oh, I'm calling from the premier's office. Premier's office, I said, holy cow, what's going on? He said, well, we tried to reach you toward the RS champion. Then I'm thinking, oh, what happened? You know, my my, my wife's parents were not that well, and my sister wasn't that well. And I said, holy oh, shit, what's happening? You know? So I said, well, how, what's going on? He says, well, uh, the premier wants to know, uh, it was Premier Graham then, if uh, you would agree to be the next nominee for the position of Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick. I said, you gotta be kidding. He said, no, I'm not kidding. I said, Jesus, I don't know. I said, look, I've only got another year and a half to be judge. I'm looking forward so much to retiring uh, and having 60, 60% of my time as, as a, uh, okay. And then 40% of the work. I said, that's not so bad because I had, to, I had other ambitions to travel across this country on another project. But I said, geez, I don't know. I said, uh, uh, I no, I said, I can't give you a yes or no at this time. My wife and I will have to, well, Take this to prayer, right? I called this sermon. Should I say yes or no to this thing? And I said, so I, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you. He says, when? I said, well, when do you need to know? Is it tomorrow morning? He said, tomorrow morning. I said, well, oh, what time? Same time. You know, what difference in time? I said, well, well, we could not go back to bed. So I told my wife, here's what it's about. Here's what they want me to do. And, and I said, I really don't want to do it because I'm looking forward to that magic age of 65. And uh, uh, so anyway, we took it to prayer. And in the prayer, you, what you do is you say, I will agree to be nominated to for and against. I will not agree to be nominated to for and against. You explore the question first as a positive question as well as a negative question. And then you take this stuff to prayer and then find out what the creator or Lord's wish in my life at this time. So. Anyway, we did that, my wife and I, we had a spiritual director guiding us from New Brunswick and we said, this is extremely confidential. And so um, went to bed that night, mine wasn't no, my wife said, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I told her why, and she told me why, she thought I was ready for it, I said. Uh, so anyway, I, next morning we got up and I called the guy back and uh, said, look, I said, I'm sorry, I said, uh, we can't make a decision. I said, we need more time. How much more time do you need? I said, well, I don't know. I said, what's your, he said, you'll call me by three o'clock, uh, New Brunswick time, which will be 11 o'clock uh, back in Arizona. I said, well, okay, we'll have you answer for you one way or the other. So again, we took it to prayer, and, you know, 10.30, yes, no, <laughs> quarter. Finally, about 10 minutes to 11, my wife says, well, look at, there's no guarantee you're going to get this thing anyway. Nobody's going to know you ever going to nominate it. Well, now everybody did how the process works. But I said, he said, it's only nomination. So what do you got to lose? I said, okay, all right then. So I called the guy. I said, okay, but the answer is yes. And he said, um, okay, I need your CV and all this stuff. I said, well, and the assurance was nobody would ever, ever know this was happening. I can talk publicly about it now because it leaked out. Uh, so uh, I had to get a hold of my son uh, in New Brunswick, and I said, "Look at son, here's my uh, here's here's my uh, password for my for my computer. There's a document there, which is my CV. Can you send that to the province?" So they did, and and so 
Uh, my sons were the only ones who knew, Beth and I, and her brother, and our spiritual brother. Those are the only ones we knew who knew this was happening. So, and nobody would ever know about this stuff. So, anyway, we came back after our vacation and came back. And I've been scheduled for an Indigenous event, actually, in PEI the following weekend. And um, so, uh, Friday afternoon, my secretary comes in and says, There's a message here for you. I said, Message from who? Somebody from the Canadian press in Ottawa. Canadian press. I said, Judges aren't supposed to talk to the press. What's this all about anyway? So there's something about some kind of rumor that's going around in Ottawa that you're going to be the next lieutenant governor of New Brunswick. I said, no, they're crazy. I said, who starts, who starts, this is, here my words were, who would start stupid rumors like that? I said, because I, I couldn't tell anybody, right? So anyway, I said, um, no, I can't talk to him. I said, uh, look, I've got court this afternoon and you tell them, no, I'm not going to talk to him at all. And so sure enough, she returned to call him. And then so he called my wife. I said, look, the word's out. I don't know what's happening, but I got to call my contact and find out what's happening. And sure enough, I went and contacted the, con the one I knew. They said, well, they're leaking it out out there. We haven't done it. I said, why? He said, well, who knows why governments do things. Well, I said, well, okay, all right. but I'm not going to say anything publicly because, uh, first of all, I can't. And so, I called my chief judge and I said, no, oh, by the way, <laughs> this is going to come out in the news tomorrow. I don't want you to get caught off guard. And this was all supposed to be secret and confidential, but obviously it isn't. And he said, okay. I said, so they'll probably ask you as chief judge of the provincial court, what do you think? I said, that's the background. That's all I can tell you about court. I said, Nobody has reached out to me from the Prime Minister's office, and I doubt if they will anyway. So, <laughs> so, I, so anyway, so, um, so I got ready to go. My wife had packed for me to go to PI and everything, so I went and uh, took my stuff at home. And then there was this guy called me, guy I know, you know, he was a friend, photographer. He says, "Great, how are you doing?" I said, "Not too bad." How about you? Good. He says, "Look, I need a picture." A picture. I said, what? He says, "Well, for the story tomorrow morning." I said, "What story?" You know, still trying to act dumb, a kind of a thing. <laughs> but anyway, he says, look, he says, I said, listen, I can't, I can't give you anything. Uh, I just can't. Mm -hmm. He says, well, all I need is a picture. I said, can you assure me that you can be here in five minutes? And I didn't realize he was in the neighborhood where I live. So it's two or three minutes later, the door comes knocking on the door and it's him. I said, holy gee, that was fast. He, I said, um, okay, if you take this picture, I said, make sure you don't put a date on it. Because I told the media, I'm not, I, I told the media can't uh, find out about this. He says, okay, don't worry. He said, uh, my job is just as far to get a picture of you. And that was it. So I took off the PEI, I went to register at a hotel where they had room for me. So, <laughs> you know, it, when I went there in this particular hotel, they said, oh, Justice Nicholson. I said, well, Judge Nicholas. Well, we got you. You're from you're from New Brunswick, aren't you? I said, well, yeah. He said, okay, we got a room here for you. So, okay, it doesn't matter what my name was. So it was a good thing he was Nicholson. Apparently, that whole weekend, the media tried to get a hold of me. They, they found out I was in PEI. They called every hotel. Is there a Judge Nicholas? No, no Judge Nicholas here. And Nicholson is such a common name in PEI, so they couldn't didn't matter anyway. So I didn't. Anyway, so I didn't hear anything about it until it was Saturday morning. My wife called me and says, oh, yeah, it's in the news, all right. I said, okay, well, uh, I won't say anything anyway over here. So so that's how that's how it unfolded, you know. It, it was, uh, it's a mystery. And uh, I thought, well, I doubt if I'll be left. Uh, I doubt if I'll be left in the with all this publicity. And um, on my way back from PEI that Monday night, uh, once I got off the bridge and I had to go to, uh, I went to get a newspaper and then I stopped in at the Sudbury. Have you ever been a big stop? I stopped in Sudbury. And I said, and it started to snow. I said, Holy cat. And if I look at my watch, I said, geez, this is going to be at night. I'm not going to get home. And it's storming really bad. So I said, I better get some provisions, you know, like extra sandwiches, sweets, and stuff. I was stuck on the road somewhere. <laughs> so, and I called my wife. I said, look, I said, it's storming hard here. And, Moncton area, and uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to get through tonight. 
tell her when I'll get there. She says, well, take your time. It's, it's okay over here. So oh, a friend of mine had told me once, he said, Graydon, if you want to go to a snowstorm, get behind a transport truck. So I saw a transport truck pulling out. And so I followed it. And then all of a sudden there was this car came fast and went between the transport truck and I, and it was kind of slippery. I said, oh, you better slow down for sure. I mean, so anyway, the, the truck took off and the car took off and I went at sort of like a snail's pace. And of course I couldn't see them at all. And once they were gone, the storm was so bad. And when you leave that uh, Salisbury exit going toward Moncton or Fredericton, you go up and then there's a bit of a dip and a dip uh, is sort of that there's a um, transmission line. And no kidding, Pam, as I, I, was, I, was, I, I was going slow, no other traffic, all of a sudden I saw three deer, albino deer. And because usually snow would not remain on the, on the deer when it's snowing, mm -hmm. I mean, take it off or whatever. But, and one had crossed, was it was in the median and there were kills still too and I so I stopped there but they all looked at me and I let them all cross and then after they crossed I left and uh like for my particular culture you know albino albino deer animals are messengers and about 10 kilometers after I think the weather cleared right up and I got home about 30 or something yeah, you know, it's just amazing. I said, wow, I said, holy cow, what, the, what does all this mean, right? So it, from there until uh, eventually the call came in September, around Labor Day, that, you know, that I would get this appointment. So, wow. So it, that's how it happened. There was no, again, uh, when you look at some of these things, there was never any magic plan on my part on any of these things. Just because I had to be the creator. Wow. I mean, what, what an incredible life story. And each one of those things just individually w are individual achievements. Like, you know, go getting a university degree way back when there wasn't as many Native people doing that or uh, getting a law degree or becoming a teacher or going to social work or like yeah. all, of the, all yeah. of the paths yeah. that you've been on. It, yeah. They all seem like separate paths, but they all kind of seem to come together ultimately to help our people. And that's, I mean, that's an incredible life story. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's, as I said, you know, uh, whenever I talk to graduates, I said, look, whatever you do, don't follow my path because I can't hold a job. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, it's just so inspiring. And I didn't even know all of this. You know, I knew some of the parts, but I didn't know some of the other detours. And it's just, so encouraging you know because some people as you know some younger people get really concerned or anxious that they don't know what their path is they don't have every year planned out until they're you know 80 and it's and it's like sometimes you just let have to let the path unravel before you you know just walk by a law school and see if they will take you in <laughs> yeah that's right yeah yeah, yeah. that's right yeah it, it's been an amazing uh amazing uh uh path of life, I guess, path journey is what I would call it. And, uh, no, no, it's, it's, I mean, I have no regrets. Uh, I've, you know, I've read, uh, I've lived really a full, a very full uh, uh, life uh, with a lot of challenges, a lot of um, opportunities. So that's cool. And now St. Thomas is, is so happy because you're back at St. Thomas as the chancellor. And I think that's just so wonderful that you're, you're back there where you helped inspire me to go to law school and do the things I did. And yeah, yeah in fact, when, uh, there was a student came to me, I think three years ago, cause I was, I've been back at St. Thomas full time since 2015. Uh, again, those are different circumstances, but anyway, so her mother had said, you've got to, because she was a student from UND, right? And we've got neighboring campuses. So she, she told her daughter, you've got to take a course from Great Nichols. He taught me, and he also taught my father. So you're the third generation. So, and now this young woman, she, she's going to uh, University of Ottawa Law School. 
See, that's great. You're like a grandfather to so many of us out there, you know, like the way native people just traditionally adopt people. You're just going around encouraging all these people to go out and do the same things you did in different ways. And that's inspiring. And I just, I really want to thank you for everything you've done throughout your life for our people, um, how you encouraged me uh, along the way, uh, all the positive things you've ever said. And of course, for coming on here and doing this extended interview, hope you weren't <laughs> watching the time. <laughs> oh, really to, no, I wasn't. To share it because, you know, one of the things that our listeners like the most is not just the formal stuff, but it's all the stories in between. How did you get there and what happened? And, and it's not, it's not the perfectly laid out path that everyone thinks it is. It really is just, it unravels in front of you. Yeah. Well, it's, as I say, you know, the creators uh, watched over me and I'm very grateful of that. And if I can return any of these gifts to our people, that's great. Well, Lee Wan Graydon, uh, thank you again. I, I appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom and experiences and funny stories with all of us. <laughs> and, and I'll be sure to post links on the um, show notes where you can um, see Graydon's page at St. Thomas and links to the treaty panel that we did a couple weeks back where oh, we had a great true. conversation about yeah. the treaties. <sighs> And thanks to our listeners for taking up the responsibility to learn more so that you can help take concrete actions to help bring about social justice and earth justice in partnership with sovereign Indigenous peoples. Till next time, keep living a warrior life. Walaliag. Walaliag.